Okay. How did we go with the exercise? Yeah, it was really, really super, super easy. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Super, super, super easy. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is just, um, this example is just to get you going with a very basic Hello World style program. But of course, there is more interesting things ahead. Okay. Hi, Thing. So now let's get on to multidimensional arrays. Now I'm aware that we do, we only have about half an hour left in this workshop. So we'll try and get through this section and then get you onto the, the last exercise. Well, the second last exercise, but we'll, we'll see how we go. All right, so now we've got a way of allocating and accessing memory in a one-dimensional array. That's very good. We know how to do this dynamically. And I will just make sure that I share my screen because I sometimes forget. OK, there we go. All right. So now let's see how we apply this to higher dimensional structures like matrices. Um, and of course, tensors um, can be n dimensional. Um, so, uh, well, a matrix is a tensor, but we won't get into those semantics. <laughs> but um, so, how do we apply? How do we apply this? How do we work with higher dimensional structures? Okay, so fortunately, we don't need multi-dimensional array representations in C or C plus plus because if we do the pointer to pointer to pointer method, and that is one way of representing. Higher dimensional structures in C and C. Um, all we need to do, sorry, the, the pointer to pointer to pointer method, if your number of dimensions gets high, the overhead of accessing um, those intermediate arrays of pointers, the overhead of accessing those gets, um, gets quite high. So, there is a better way. All we need to do is treat the one dimensional memory allocation as if it was folded into a higher dimensional structure. Then we can use math to step in any of the higher dimensions. So shown below is a memory allocation of 24 elements. Okay. So there is a memory allocation here of 24 elements. And below it are two 3D arrays of size 3 by 4 by 2. And they are constructed by regarding the memory al allocation as if it were folded according to either row major or column major ordering. Now. When you get to higher dimensions, it becomes confusing to think about what is a column and what is a row. So let's move away from that, um, that way of thinking. Let's instead think of the number of elements we need to get from one, um, one element to the other. So if we were to jump in any dimension, um, you can see from this diagram. So let's have a close look at the row major and column major implementations for this 3D array. Can you see that or notice that if you want to step by one in any dimension, there is always a stride of the same number of elements to go from one element to the next along any dimension. So in the row major implementation here, we can see that we always need to step um, by eight elements to go one step along dimension zero. So dimension zero is our first dimension. Okay, 
So if we're stepping along dimension one, so that's this dimension here, we need to step two elements, so zero, two, four, six. But if we need to step into the plane in the last dimension, you can see here that the stride is one element. So, so in order to go by one element in any dimension, and it doesn't matter if you're using row major or column major ordering, all you need to know is the stride for that dimension. So if so we've got um, we've got our 3D arrays and they're separated into two planes and each plane has uh, three elements down dimension zero and four elements along dimension one and there are two elements along the last dimension. Okay. Now in row major ordering, the last dimension has a stride of one. But in column major ordering, the first dimension, or dimension zero, has a stride of one. So have a look on the right. Dimension zero has a stride of one. So going down has a stride of one. So if you're, if you're at any point in this array and you want to go in any direction, all you need to know is the stride. So in column major, the strides vector, or the strides vector for either of these arrays, is just the stride in this one-dimensional allocation that you need to step in order to go by one element in any dimension. OK, so, so if I want to step by one element along dimension one, so this is along this dimension. Then the stride vector for dimension one contains a value of three. So that means I need to go by three elements in this big allocation in order to step by one element along dimension one. So that's the stride in this dimension. The stride in dimension zero is one, and the stride in dimension two is 12. So there's always a step of 12 elements in order to go um, in order to go one element in dimension two. And that's in the column major implementation, but in the row major implementation, the stride is only one for the last dimension. Okay. So if you are anywhere in this three-dimensional structure, all you need to know is the stride or a dimension in order to step in any dimension. OK, so that's that's really cool because that makes our math quite easy. If we know our offset already, if we know our offset already, um, then we can just apply a stride to get to another offset um, in order to step in any dimension of the array. OK, so this gives us a way to work out what our position is in this large one-dimensional allocation as a function of our coordinates in the array. So if we know our coordinate vector C, and this is zero-based indexing. It doesn't work for one-based indexing. But if we have our zero-based coordinate vector C, then our position in this one-dimensional allocation P is just given by the dot product of our coordinate vector with the stride vector. And that's how we can find our position in the one-dimensional allocation as a function of our n-dimensional coordinate. Um, and we take the dot product with the stride vector, and then that gives us our position. OK, so for example, 
we take the coordinates C is equal to 1, 3, 1. So that's, um, that's 1 down and then 0, 1, 2, 3 across. And then we have 1 down. So we're in this plane where it says 15. So we can see 15 there. We can see 15. Now, if we take the dot product of this coordinate vector which, with our stride vector, so our stride vector is 8, 2, 1. So we take our dot product of 1, 3, 1 with 8, 2, 1, and that's the calculation of the dot product there. We end up with 15, which is our answer. So that's the position within the one-dimensional allocation. So let's try that same coordinate. Um, let's try that same coordinate with the column major implementation where our stride vector is different. So we take our coordinates, one, three, one, and we take a dot product with a stride vector, and that gives us 22. And there it is. So that is our position inside the one dimensional allocation as a function of our coordinate. So this way of thinking about multi dimensional arrays is super powerful. Because in order to step by one dimension, all we need to know is the stride for that dimension. It is also much, much cheaper to access multidimensional arrays in this way, because math is cheap to calculate on, um, on, on your computer. Math is cheap to calculate, but um, fetching things from memory is expensive. And if your indexing is contained within, um, if you're using the pointer to pointer method, then your pointers will be contained in arrays and fetching things from arrays is expensive. So therefore your multidimensional array index will be slow for higher dimensional structures if you're using pointer to pointers. So let's use math instead because math is cheap to calculate. Okay, so how do we construct a strides vector in either ordering scenario? So for row major ordering, we fill the stride vector um, from right to left. And all we have to do to fill the stride vector is we put a one at the last element. So we start with a one at the last element. Then we multiply by the size of the array times that element, and then that gives us our stride for the next dimension. Then we just do it again, uh, 2 multiplied by 4, and then that gives us our stride for the first dimension, or dimension 0. OK, and doing the strides vector is as simple as that. For column major ordering, we start with a 1 at index 0, or dimension 0. Then we multiply by the size of we multiply that one by the size of the array for dimension zero, and then that becomes our new stride. So it's like a zipper. So we go like this and this and this. So that's how we get our stride vector. And this is applicable to any number of dimensions. So that is, yeah, that's how we do, that's how we do um, multi-dimensional array indexing in a cheap and efficient way. And you can use this technique on GPUs and you can use it with CPUs of CPU code as well. Okay, so there are, now we'll just talk about rudimentary file IO. There are much better ways to write binary data to files using self-descriptive and cross-platform formats like HDF5. Sometimes though you might be stuck and just need a quick way to get your data in or out of your program for testing and verification purposes. So testing and verification only really. <laughs> Within the, su the C subset of the C++ language there is a simple way to read and write binary data but it, but it spits out the data in the Indian representation that your architecture so you just have to be aware that this data may not be portable to other architectures 
without accounting for differences in endiness. So please don't use raw binary dumps for actual production code. But hey, if you're stuck um, and you need to do some debugging and you need to dump some data to disk, this is how you're going to do it. Um, the standard f open function and the standard f close pair of functions, they open and close files. So in C, you'll just be using open and close. And, um, and this is the function that you would use. So you bring in, you give it a C style string, which is the file name, and then you have the mode at which you're going to use the file. And what's returned is a file pointer. So with C, we can throw away these standard colon colons, but with C++, we, we use those, those things from the standard namespace. Okay. So um, the mode in which you open a file is governed a bit by history. There are two main modes to access a file, text mode and binary mode. So Linux and Windows differ in how to represent a new line. So on Windows, a new line means a return character followed by a new character, whereas on Linux, it is just a new line character. So opening a text file in text mode means lines are read and written in an OS-specific way. Oh, that's not very good. Um, opening a file in binary mode, so this is the other way of doing it, means that everything is read or written to as is from the file, and no special interpretation is applied to new line characters. OK, so here are the modes that you can have when opening a file. You can use W to open it in text mode. So that overwrites the file if it already exists. Or you can use WB, which opens the file in binary mode. Um, R is just opening a file for reading in text mode, but RB is opening a file for reading in binary mode. A opens a file for appending, and it creates the file if it doesn't exist. And A, B opens a file in the append with binary um, binary mode. So if you add a plus sign to these modes, you can allow updates to happen to the file as well. So it's kind of like a read-write modifier that allows information to flow um, to and from the file. OK. So this you can click on this site here to explain in more detail what the how the plus sign changes behavior with the file. But normally, you'll just be using the more basic modes here, like um, WB and RB. So that opens a file for reading, for writing or reading in binary mode. Now, the way of working with files harkens back to the days when we were using tape drives. So the so within each file, there is this notion of a position within the file. And you change the position backwards and forwards in much the same way that you would rewind through a tape. So there's, a, there's this notion of a file position in a, in a file. When you open a file for any sort of operation, you use the F open. But you need to include um, standard I.O. in the header of the program. So this will either be C standard I.O. for C++ code or stdio.h um, for C code. And what you'll get back is a file pointer. So that's what you'll get back when you open a file for, um, for reading or writing. Now, if this fails, then the file pointer will be filled with null. So you can check then if something went wrong. And when you're finished with a file, uh, it must be closed with standard F close. So that will close the, the file. So you pass in the pointer to the file, and it will close the file. So as I said, as I said before, every open file has this notion of a current position, and that's that's from the days that we were using tape um, to do I.O. So you can rewind or fast forward this position using the fseek function. And you can report on the current position of the file using ftel. 
So that's the signature for these fseek and ftel um, functions. Um, the value relative offset is the offset to seek relative to its position. And the position is one of seek set for the beginning of file, seek current for the uh, current position and seek end. So you can seek, you can seek to the beginning or you can seek to the end of the file. So this is how you can tell how big a file is. So you open a file, um, you can seek to the end and then you can tell uh, where you are and that will tell how many bytes long the file is. Then you can seek back to the beginning of the file again using um, yeah, using fseek. So sync set is to the beginning of the file. Okay, so that's how you um, that's how you get around in a file once you have opened it. How do we actually read and write data to that file? So once your file is open in binary mode, you can use standard f read and standard f write. And what they will do is that they, the f read and f write, they take a void pointer and they read or write a certain number of bytes um, to or from that file. So f read reads um, a certain number of bytes from the file starting at the, the file position, and f write writes a certain number of bytes to the file. And of course, you must make sure that you have enough um, memory allocated to support that which you are reading or writing uh, to disk. Otherwise, there will be um, a memory access violation. So in the file C style file IO is a complete example of writing five floats to a file and then reading it back into an array. So this is just for your reference. It's like an example program. Um, we are creating a string that contains the file name. Then we allocate and fill an array. In this case, I'm just filling it with the index. Um, then you open a file and write the array to it. You close the source array and then you free, uh, free the source. And then what I'm doing is I'm just doing the reverse process. So I read, I open the file for reading. I seek to the end to get the number of bytes. I grab the number of bytes. I decide how many elements are in that file. And then I allocate an array. Um, and, then, um, and then I could, of course, check that, that information that I've read back in. Um, and when I'm done, I free up my arrays and I then close the file. Uh, so that is that is it with regards to the um, the simple C++ or survival C++ um, teaching material. But I now have um, the next exercise to do. So if we have a look in exercises, We've now got another exercise called Image Creator. So if we open open Image Creator, now the Image Creator exercise helps you to solidify the knowledge that you just gained in um, with regards to multi-dimensional array indexing. So um I might just I might just go back to the array indexing section and just make sure that we've covered the fastest direction of the arrays. So when you're when you're looping over the space of an array, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether you're using row major or column major. If you're using a nested series of loops to cover this multidimensional space in an array, it is good for performance generally when you are using CPU code. It is good for performance to make sure 
that your innermost loop um, traverses the dimension of your array where the stride is smallest. And that is because, and that is because when you are reading memory from main memory, that memory that is read in from main memory is always brought in as a cache line. And that cache line usually takes usually takes up about 64 bytes. And that cache line is brought in as a log of memory. Now, if you are iterating over the dimension of your array, so in the innermost loop, if you're iterating over the dimension of your array in which the array elements have a stride of one, then you can make use or you can reuse this memory that was brought into the cache. And that is why, that is why we always like to have, at least in with CPU code, we always like to have the innermost um, loop to traverse the dimension of the array that has the stride of one. So that's that's why we're doing that. Now moving back to the exercise, um, what I want to do with this is solidify the knowledge that we picked up about using multi-dimensional array indexing. Now, this code is fairly straightforward. It only requires two lines of code to implement. OK, but those two lines require a solid graph of multi-dimensional array indexing in order to get it right. OK, so let's have a look at the code. So if you go to um, the course material, exercises, image creator, and let's have a look at the image creator code here. So bring that across. OK, so this image creator code, what it does is that we have an array of size n0 by n1. We allocate a one-dimensional array that is big enough to store this two-dimensional structure. OK, so the, the array is of size n0 times n1. So we create this one-dimensional array using calc. Now, we could, use, we could use new as well in C++, but we just chose to use calc in this instance. Now, we've got a two-dimensional um, space that we're covering. So we're using a nested loop here. And I'm using row major indexing for the array. So this means with row major indexing that our innermost loop needs to cover dimension one because that is the um, that is the um, dimension of the array in which the array elements have a stride of one. Okay, so we're covering this space and we're calling this kernel function. Now, this is very similar to the way that um, frameworks like HIP um, do their coverage of their compute spaces. So if you've got a grid, um, what you will do is you'll execute or launch a kernel, and an instance of this kernel will be run at every point in this up to three-dimensional space. So this kernel function is called for a particular element in your array. And in this fill kernel, you are given the coordinates i0, i1, as well as the size of the array n0 and n1. Now, your task is to convert these coordinates, as well as this size, into an offset to access array A. And what we're going to do is we're just going to fill the array with a value of i0 times i1. So it's a very simple filling of this array. And then what it will do is it will, um, it will print out the array and then write out the array to disk before closing it. So your job. Your job is to provide that mapping 
from the coordinates i0 and i1 into the one-dimensional um, into the one-dimensional array coordinate for our allocation. So that's um, that's the upshot of this program. So you can open imagecreator.cpp and have a look to see what the file is doing. And um, you can use make. So I have a make file in this directory. And this make file can make the program. So if I go to the if I go to the exercise, uh, you can go to course material, change directory to exercises, and then change directory to image creator. And then I can just go make, and then that will make the file called image creator. And I I run the I run the program at the moment. So if I go image creator. Exe. Okay, it produces nothing but zeros at the moment. And that's because I haven't implemented the right transformation from the coordinates, and I haven't implemented setting the value of A at the right index. So what you need to do is provide that coordinate mapping, um, make changes to the fill kernel, and then if it works, then it should produce the same answer as image creator answer.exe. And that answer file is in the same location. Now, you might encounter bugs within when you're trying to put this code together, when you're trying to put that thing together. So when you're debugging, you can either use C or C++ style print statements to print variables during the execution of the program, but that is quite laborious. Or you could use a debugger. And this section here is just like a mini tutorial as to how you can use the GDB debugger um, to debug the program. So I've already set up the command line arguments so that it's friendly um, for debugging. And usually that means that you need to have the G flag when you're compiling with G++. You need to have the G flag for compilation. And then you set the optimization level to quite low. So if I've got, so I've got in the make file already a compiler debugger friendly um, argument. So I've got G and then optimization level zero. So that's the lowest form of optimization, so there's not really any optimization there. So you compile the program with these optimization flags, and then you can use this program called GDB. Now, GDB gives you access um, to the different elements of the program, so the different um, variables. So you can print the variables during execution of the program. So if I run, so if I have a look at GDB, so I'll just use GDB um, image creator.exe. So I can run, I can run this um, run this program under the control of a debugger. And then I can do run and that will run through the entire program. But what I can do is I can set a breakpoint by typing B, and I can break at any function that I like. In this case, I'll break at fill kernel. So let's go to image creator. So fill kernel is my function that I will be calling. So from within GDB, I can set a breakpoint. And then when I run that, it will stop when it gets to that break point. And then I can do things like print i0, and it has a certain value. I can print i1, and it has a certain value. So I can print variables and um, to see what's going on. Then if I want to step to the next line in the code, I can go n. So that will go to the next line of code. And because I don't have anything in that function, it just 
gets to the end of that function. So I step in again, and now I'm back in the image creator, the main, the main function of image creator. So then I go in for next, and here we are, we're calling fill kernel. So you can step through, you can step through a function, or you can step through a program and print everything that is happening. The debuggers are really powerful. They're really, really good way of um, getting into a program and seeing what's happening. You can even print the values of an array. So like that. Now, in this case, um, my array is called R, so R0, and I can print R1. So I can examine what's going, I can examine what's going on. Right, now if you want to step into a function, so if I want to step into a function, I can use the S command. So that steps into a function, and then I can go N, N means the next line. If I want to run the program again, I can just type run, and then it will start the program again from the beginning. So you can set breakpoints, and you can delete breakpoints, and then when you're done, you can go quit to quit the debugger. And of course, if you are stuck at any time, you can always pink at the solution, image creator answer of CPP. The bugs are fixed in this one, and then you can compile, you can compile and run that. So there is the answer code. And yeah, so have at it. Um, this, uh, this is the next exercise. And the exercise after that has to do with matrix multiplication. So if we have a look at the matrix multiplication code, or the matrix multiplication example, um, matrix multiplication is a bit more involved, but the same thing, the same thing is true. Uh, the same thing is true. What we have to do is we have to provide the missing math to index into matrices A and B. And once you do that, um, once you provide that, then you'll have um, an answer that is the same as the solution. So the matrix multiplication code is very important because that's the um, that's the example that we will be using for the HIP course. So in the HIP course, we will be using matrix multiplication as our um, as our example algorithm, and the exercise is just, again, filling in those lines of code to do with translating the coordinates into a position within arrays A and B.